It's a bit like a character actor. Yes, it is. Who, who yes, has always is. acted it's, similar. I think that's a part. very good point. That is exactly what it is. It is based... It's more like casting a film than setting out a normal record. And it was just a lot more fun, and we made infinitely better records as a result of it, really. I mean, um, it required very good musicianship, which, fortunately, the budgets were there to, to ensure that that could come through. Richard Preston, as a producer of most of these wonderful records, was um, also an integral part of creating that sound. Um, but these records are now... I mean, I'm... I'm are now revered in all kinds of areas. I think that it's also true to say that the largest impact of L Records in that period was on the Japanese. And the Japanese, J-pop, was hardly in existence until well, the L The Japanese Records. got it, didn't they? Where they did. It, it yes. struggled in England. It yep. did get press. Yes. A tiny bit of radio, yep. but the sales were minimal yep. in the it, UK. Yes. I, I, but Japan, we got sales. Yes, I can explain it all in, really, at this distance now. Because, you see, people in England thought we were cheating, you see. The press... We had individual people in the press that were great supporters of what we were doing. They understood it and, the, and they were thrilled by it. And they said this in print. But when they went into editorial meetings to say, L Records, is, this is seriously important, the older people, the traditionalists, would say, but, you know, it's, you know, it's not paying its dues, it's not, it's not rock and roll, it's not any of these formal things that it needs to be, you know. And, you know, Frank Zappa had taught me... Frank Zappa is a fantastic illustration that there are no rules about any of these things at all. Frank Zappa embodied all the eclecticism in the world. You can do anything, right? And the English at the time were simply not accustomed to that. You know, if you didn't play pubs, if you didn't play all these grotty places and travel up and down the length of the country having a horrible time, you, <laughs> you didn't somehow qualify for the game, yeah. you know? But you see, in Japan, it's totally different. In Japan, they live in a society that is a cartoon society, where things are naturally stylized. They're not looking for the truth in things. They accept it for what it is. You know, if they see an image in that way, that is the style. That is simply, you know, they consume or they don't consume. And so they were mentally much more prepared to understand El Records. Because in every respect, there's really very little to understand. It is simply the presentation. You don't have to know anything about Renaissance architecture, which may be in the songs or whatever, to enjoy the songs, you know. Um, very often with the Japanese, there's that kind of language problem. But I always was able to overcome that with beautiful melodies and good looks. You see, in these records here... These are two of the original vinyls. Would be good, yeah. for instance. This is to appeal to a Japanese, to a young Japanese yeah. person in the 80s. Yeah. This is what naturally comes out of my fingers. I mean, it's my natural thing, but it does coincidentally appeal to them. And Bad Dream Fancy Dress has the same immediacy. Yeah. Ab absolutely, you know, gorgeous, bold. It says important. It's a classic album. And the English absolutely hated it, you know. It was just... <laughs> because it wasn't, you know, a bunch of guys yeah. standing against a brick wall, you know, and, yeah. and there were no <laughs> drugs involved on yeah. the face of it. You know, there may have been a hallucinogenic sort of angle to it, but people never sort of went into that. You know, there wasn't the kind of... It didn't have the elements of, that they felt gave it urban credibility. And there was really. a Japanese too, wasn't there? Was yes, there was L a Japanese. Package Japanese. Um, yes, there was. I think Derek Jarman filmed, didn't he? He did. Jer Derek Jarman wasn't at all the shows. He was... At the initial shows, he... The, sh the package was the King of Luxembourg, Anthony Adverse and Louis Philippe. And the King of Luxembourg was, of course, Simon Turner. Was Simon Turner. Charles Simon, Prodigy, yes. Who yes. actually has also been interviewed on Cherry Red TV. Right. Man. Simon Turner, um, like nobody else you'll ever meet, a, a, a volcano of a fellow, really. Um, he'd been a child actor. He was in The Big Sleep with Robert Mitchum. He had been a, developed by Jonathan King to be the next Osman slash Cassidy. He was going to be the English and um, somehow it didn't happen. He certainly had the looks for it. Um, he'd come into Cherry Red when we were there and, and, and even worked for us for a time, in fact. He did in, indeed, in, yeah. in, the press yeah. office, in the press office. And so basically the King of Luxembourg was a vehicle for him to go back to where he was with Jonathan King and get it right, you know. And, and he did this spectacularly. I think the records that Simon made at their best are just masterful. Um, and they have a great many fans. I mean, you, you'll remember that Alan McGee... Couldn't work out how we made Valerie at all. He just yeah. thought it was an, a wonderful, extraordinary record. Not a record that he could make himself. And, um, I, you know, I was very flattered by that, really. I mean, I, Simon um, was on the tour. He, well, I mean, 
I mean, what extraordinary. Um, I, I think Simon drank his way through Japan, really. I remember t- I took him to a film studio in, in Tokyo where he was doing a... He was miming to a picture of Dorian Gray. Yeah. And that experience really summed Simon up for me. He was inebriated to such a degree I had to carry him into and out of the cab. Um, into the film studio and when the light came on the clouds just disappeared and this professionalism yeah. emerged and he did a fantastic physical take in a way that you know only a professional can do a professional actor can do um, which had the cameraman applauding at the end and everything which they seriously did and, um, and then afterwards he went back to being the way he was <laughs> But, you know, he was, he was able to do that. On stage, Simon was unbelievably good. Yeah. Unbelievably good. Um, it was like a psychedelic Andy Williams, really. It was wonderful. And Derek Jarman had a long association, a long friendship with Simon, to return to that. And Simon had done some scores for him. And Derek had with him a Super 8 camera and just filmed everything, you know, around the, the venue. In I'd fact. love to find that footage. It's supposed yes. to be somewhere in Simon Turner's house, but yes, uh, yes. so it's, far it's remained... Well, we understand that it's Simon Turner's family's yeah. home somewhere, and it's under a bed we'll somewhere, try in a tin. one day, and that yes, would be a legendary deal. It certainly would. So tell us, <clears throat> tell us about how L... Because that was the first kind of phase of it. Just talk us through briefly how the first, aid, the first phase wound down. Well, yes, I mean... Uh, I mean, we were really into our stride with the would-be goods and, and the, certainly by the second King of Luxembourg album, the would-be goods and, and badgering and fancy dress and, and that. I mean, the style was really established. I wanted to sign a children's group called Hunky Dory at that point. Um, they lived in Lewis, in Sussex, in actual fact. And I thought, if we get our team and our writers and our producers working with this Partridge family type group, we're going to have a hit. But circumstances at the office had changed a little bit. You were out of the country. I was travelling, yeah. You know. And let's just say that not everybody shared my enthusiasm, or your enthusiasm for that matter, Ian, unfortunately. And um, so it, it, was, it was a transitional time for Cherry Red as well. And let's just say that you know, some of these ideas didn't come to fruition. There was, an, there was a, a general thought that... L Records would be a better label if I wasn't running it, you know. Not by you, in fact, but yeah, it was, it there, was, there were people that felt... It was a difficult time for you, I understand that. that yeah. You see, it's very important to understand that what L Records, if it's anything, it's its character. Yes. If you try to normalise L yeah. Records, then you lose all, all of what's yeah. good about it. You know, that, that's the thing. And, you know, they sh- really, if they'd wanted to do it, they, they probably should have just shut it down. And, and the last of, you know, few releases on yes. L were not to do with you, which they was And I think that's reflected yeah. in that, unfortunately. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And I don't think it reflects well on, on anybody, yeah. you know, as far as that goes. I was more disappointed in the artists than anything. I could understand why they did that. Yeah. But they didn't take with them the style that they had done with me, I felt. I felt they made too many compromises. Yeah. So you basically moved out of the picture... L died a very quick death after yes, that. Yes, it did. That, that, that I didn't want to move out of the picture, but yeah, it was it was the way things. It worked was the out. way things worked out. Yes, yes. yes.